And just think of all of the things that they witnessed. You know, they saw him walk on water. Peter got to walk on water with him for a little bit, right? Uh, healing the sick. Driving out demons. Raising the dead. Calming the storm. All of these things. You, you, they woke up every day. They didn't know what amazing things that they were going to witness from day to day. And he was with them through all of it. But now imagine, all of a sudden, he's gone. He was leaving them. Their world was going to change. What would life be without Jesus? Their hearts were sad. Jesus said so himself. So, how do you think they felt when he left them? First of all, they had to have been flat out amazed, right? So he's, he ascends up and he's, you know, up into the sky and then he's hidden by a cloud and he's gone. And of course, they stood there gawking, right? <laughs> I don't see him anymore. Do you see him? <laughs> then all of a sudden, there's two angels there. And they more or less more or less tell them, what are you looking at? He's going to come back in the same way. You've got a job to do, so you better get to work. That's essentially what the angels had to say. But still, they must have felt pretty sad and unsettled to be without Jesus. Yet, Jesus had given them work to do. But as far as they felt in that moment, they were alone. So, of course, we, we know they weren't actually alone, right? In fact, Jesus told them it was a good thing. It was a good thing that he was leaving them because if he didn't, the helper wouldn't come. The helper. John uses the Greek word here, paraclete. It means the one who walks beside you. Okay, the, the Holy Spirit was going to be there walking beside them through everything that they were called to do. And it was he, the Spirit, who would empower the disciples to do everything that the Lord had given them to do. And he gave them some uh, amazing jobs to do. He enabled them to heal people to preach the good news, to baptize people, to spread the gospel to places that had never heard of Jesus, knew nothing about a promised Messiah. And one day, Jesus would call them to lay down their lives for him as well. At least most of them, right? In horrible ways. Because Jesus had given the disciples an impossible task impossible to spread the word about salvation to every corner of the world in a world that misunderstood Christianity, a world that hated Christians, a world that wanted to put them to death. In fact, that's what, what happened to many of them eventually, not just the, the 12, but to other followers of Jesus as well. So by all manner of reason, that faith that Jesus brought shouldn't have survived. It should have been stamped out, dead. But it did. It did survive. More than that, it exploded. So that within three centuries, three centuries in which God's people persevered, it would eventually become the state religion of Rome. Rome would put Jesus to death at the, 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 the uh, request of the Pharisees and the Jews, of course, but nevertheless, it was the Roman Empire that put Jesus to death. It was the Roman Empire that persecuted Christians the Rome, Roman Empire, among other peoples as well, but persecuted Christians under Nero. Uh, you probably remember uh, Domitian 
uh, awful persecutions, but then it eventually becomes the state religion. And how did that all come about? Well, it came about because of the Holy Spirit, right? You know, when Jesus came, he came to invade Satan's domain. You see, Satan, before Jesus came, Satan had the run of this world. Uh, from the time of the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden up till Jesus came. He, I mean, everybody, all except for this little nation of Israel that God had created, right, and didn't do so well, because they went off idol worshiping as well. But the death, the disease, the demon possession uh, that was pervasive and still is pervasive in the world today, it just had free reign. And then what happened when Jesus came? He began to clean the devil's clock and invade his territory, Satan's domain. And he said, no, this is my world. This is my world and not your world. I've given you free reign for a while, but no more. And so he attacked Satan's dominion of sickness, healing the sick, uh, of uh, Storms, calming storms of sin, forgiving sins, and of course, eventually of death itself. And Jesus is still doing the same work today. The kingdom has grown ever since that little bitty knot of disciples in this far off, misunderstood place called Judea virtually every corner of the world uh, Jesus has penetrated. And he's still reclaiming what was his own and making all things new again. That was all possible after Jesus left because of the work of the Holy Spirit. Yes, Jesus isn't with us in that same visual way as he was with the disciples, but the Holy Spirit is. He is everywhere. Right, so, uh, but we can't see him. And so it's a little hard to identify with the Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus, well, we can imagine him in our minds, right? And he uh, can be portrayed like in the chosen and so forth. And so, you know, we can relate to him much more than the Holy Spirit, who Jesus said was like, you know, the wind. The wind blows where it wants, comes from, you know, you don't know where. Um, but it does its work anyway. In fact, the word, another word for spirit is pneuma, from which we get our word pneumatics, uh, which means spirit, wind, or breath. Okay. So we can't see him. We can't see the Holy Spirit, but we can see his work. We can see the effects of what he's doing. And we see that in the work of the church on earth. Right, we see that in lives being changed. Uh, the people that that um, we are showing God's love to, uh, the people that come to faith, the people who die in the faith and go home to be with the Lord. So, but what does all that mean to us? Okay, what does the Holy Spirit mean for us today? Well, for one thing, the Spirit is living in you. Jesus said, for those who believe in him and trust in him, he and the Father will come and make their home with him. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay. Now that happened, of course, on the day we were baptized. Right? Uh, God breathed his breath into you uh, just as the same way he breathed it into Adam. When he created Adam out of the clay of the earth and breathed breath into him. Um, and when the Spirit entered us, he began to change us so that our old self died away. Yeah, it's, it's kind of still there with us, kind of hanging on, but, but we began to act and to live like new people, right? We're no longer motivated by the same evil desires of our hearts, but now by the will of God. 
But that's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a lifelong process. You see, like, like a master sculptor, God chips away anything that, in us that he doesn't like. Right? Basically, anything that doesn't look like Jesus, he chips away. Uh, and he's reforming us, reshaping us, bit by bit, then into the image of his son. And because of that, the things of this world, our old life, begin to lose interest for us. They're, they're not as important as they once were. Uh, maybe you once lived, man, you just wanted to do as well as you could in your uh, career, uh, w- your job, whatever it was, to make as much money, to have as big a house as you could, you know, the best car, uh, to take the best vacations. And we still like to do that. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, there's nothing wrong, but the, our, our motivation's different. It is not the most important thing. It's our, our relationship with Jesus because of everything that he's done for us. And, you know, I, I don't know about you. If you look back on your life, I mean, my, I mean, a lot of other things were important to me at one time that are not important to me anymore. You know, what's the most important to me is my relationship with with the Lord and telling folks what he's done for me and that my children and grandchildren would have that same relationship with Jesus as well. Um, And it's interesting, who we are then, this new creation we are in Christ, shapes how we behave. Oh yeah, we slip up. You know, from time to time, we all do, and we regret it, and we repent. That's Thankfully, we have confession and absolution uh, for us every week. But more than anything, people see that we're different. We're not the same people that we used to be. Maybe some of the people you used to hang out with when you were younger kind of could see that in you. Something's different about you now. You know, some fo- someone might say, yeah, you're not as much fun to hang out with anymore because they're still in the grips of the world. But people see that you're different and it can change them. I- I'm reading this book now that Pastor Jeff recommended. It is called The Patient Ferment. It's about the, how the early church not only survived but flourished in the first three centuries after Jesus left, you know, through terrible persecution. And one big reason was because of the things that they did. People saw that they cared for one another. Tertullian, the historian, uh, said, see how they love one another. That was remarkable in that society. Not only did they show love for each other in their community, but for other people, uh, non-Christians, Even people who hated them, they would show love and care for them as well if they were sick. Uh, Or they would provide burial, uh, 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 pay for burials for for poor people. Uh, They didn't have to be Christian. Um, But they would care for them. And then, how they died. And when they were put into the ring with wild animals, leopards, lions, who tore them apart. They faced that death bravely, but more than that, with love for one another that was still there. And when the time at the end of those games came, then a gladiator was dispatched to put them to death. And they would gather together in a circle like family, and give each other the kiss of peace before they met their end. And they know they knew they were going to see the Lord. And that, the way that they died, got people's attention. And they said, what have they got that I don't have? What makes them live and die like that? I want to know this Jesus too. That is how the Holy Spirit worked in the early church. In the worst imaginable circumstances, 
And that's how he still works today. You know, we can look at this world as hopeless. We can look at our own country as just horribly lost. But we forget the Holy Spirit is still here amongst us. He is still reclaiming this world. He is reclaiming lives. Even among those that we think are absolutely lost, with no hope of redemption, the Holy Spirit can change them too. Just as he changed St. Paul, and just as he changed us. To him be the glory now and forever. Amen.